thank you everybody for coming today. Um, I'm Lima. And uh, today I'll be talking to you about biosecurity in the age of synthetic biology with a focus on biomedical applications. Um, hopefully you will find this topic interesting to you and applicable in your own research. And uh, please feel free to raise your hand and ask a question, interrupt me anytime. I don't mind at all. Um, so, but before I get started, um, just wanted to tell you a little bit about the California Institute of Technology, in case you're not familiar with it. It's a, a very um, famous university in Los Angeles. Um, many Nobel laureates have worked there. Um, maybe most notably in biology is um, um, Watson and Crick, who won the Nobel Prize for the structure of DNA. And a few others before them where the very crucial experiments were, um, it was determined definitively that DNA was the genetic material before protein. Um, before then there was some discussion. And of course also there's a physics and engineering branch that has to do with NASA and rocket science. And I'll be happy to talk about that later if, if you guys have any questions. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is a brief outline of my talk. First, I'll walk you through some uh, overview or, of synthetic biology, and then we'll talk about some biosecurity uh, challenges that these new technologies pose. Um, we'll talk about how we can improve biosecurity, and then uh, we'll go through a hypothetical scenario that I made up and then some conclusions. So for synthetic biology, oh, I have divided into two topics. First, I'll give you a brief overview of what I think are the most important um, areas of advancement in synthetic biology in recent history, in recent years. And then we'll go through some biomedical applications. So gene drive technology is a very important advance in synthetic biology. Uh, gene drive is putting a gene in the germline of a new animal or a new plant or a new pathogen that will change the genome permanently for future generations. So this technology it's a fairly novel. It has the potential to change the genetic makeup of the organism. Um, for example, it has been already implemented to change um, different mosquito species that can transmit diseases like Zika. This technology can be very revolutionary. However, there are significant biosecurity risks that must be considered, including the potential for accidentally releasing an organism into the environment um, that might alter the local environment where it was released. Um, and there could be unforeseen ecological consequences. And then of course there's um, the intentional theft and release for nefarious intentions. Then we have DNA synthesis screening. So, there's several new companies now that can very easily synthesize uh, genetic strands for, for you scientists. You just tell them the strand that you want, you send in your order, and within a few days or a few weeks, depending how close or how far you are from the company, if you're in Los Angeles, it's just a few days, <laughs> uh, they'll send you a whole gene, sometimes an entire genome, if it's a small genome. Um, and then voila. You can put it in your cells or in a plasmid, whatever it is that you're gonna do. Um, and this has also revolutionized synthetic biology. It used to take years and then months to be able to achieve this. You had to be a very highly, um, highly qualified and highly trained student to be able to achieve this successfully. Now, no more. You just order and it comes in the mail. But again, um, there are biosecurity concerns that come with this technology, which is 
the companies that are receiving, so, so this technology is not being regulated currently by any government um, or any states because the technology is moving faster than the policies and, and the politicians. So the companies that are providing the service, they're taking it upon themselves to self-regulate. One of the things that they do is they review the genetic sequences that are being ordered to make sure that uh, you're not ordering anthrax, for example. But there's a lot of orders that are coming through and a lot of um, large genome sequences that they have to review. So this is part of uh, biosecurity. They have to develop these new tools to be able to review and detect what is being ordered, is anything toxic, potentially harmful, and, uh, and then be able to stop that and not process those orders. Then of course we have CRISPR that everybody loves and CRISPR-based diagnostics. Again, this technology will revolutionize, it already has revolutionized biology and medicine uh, and will continue to do so. Um, but it can have, it, it, although it can have very substantial benefits in public health and um, elsewhere, it can also raise serious biosecurity concerns for the same reason as um, the other topics that I already mentioned, which is somebody could, for, on purpose, genetically modify an organism to make it more pathogenic, more harmful, um, to produce a gene that might create a toxin unintentionally or intentionally. And, um, and again, because there's no laws or, or policies that regulate this yet, this is all being self-regulated by the scientific community. So ethical guidelines and regulatory frameworks need to be developed um, nationally and internationally and regionally. And this all has to come about from continued and ongoing scientific discussions in all of the groups, all of the stakeholders. Oops. Okay, then we have this really cool area, which is the extinction of extinct species and synthetic organisms. So for example, in the US, there's someone that wants to revive the megalodon shark, which was bigger than the T-Rex. And um, it might be possible to do that. And then there's a potential to create new species of bacteria that didn't exist at all. And this technology already exists. You can create a de novo. You can order your genes from a company and insert it in a donor cell. And, and now you have a new bacteria. And again, this is our very exciting research, but there's biosecurity concerns. If you bring back a species that's already extinct, how will that affect the already existing species? How will that affect the environment? Um, and also what kind of negative effects might that have in the community or in the region? And for these microorganisms that can be synthesized de novo, uh, we have to think about, is this going to be a new pathogen? How is it going to interact with um, known vectors, um, diseases that might spread from animals to humans or to other animals? Um, all of these things need to be considered before these experiments are done. And then there's artificial intelligence in synthetic biology. So artificial intelligence is already here. It's becoming more and more accessible as weeks go by. Um, you might have heard about ChatGPT. I heard it was a bit controversial here in Italy. <laughs> um, but these uh, tools are here. They're here to stay. They are the future of science and Sooner or later, scientists are going to adopt them and implement them, and they will help advance science, but also they pose security concerns because hacking might become easier to do. So when you think about artificial intelligence, think about your data. 
that you're collecting in your computer and how is that safe? That is a biosecurity concern as well, not just the organisms in the lab that can get out, but the information that you're generating and collecting. How is that protected from actors that might use it for negative purposes? So what are some biomedical applications of some, of some of these technologies? Gene therapy is one of them. Um, gene therapy is very promising. It's already been used in clinical trials in the United States to treat different types of cancer, genetically inherited disorders that until very recently were considered incurable and now it's quite possible that they can be cured. Um, CAR T cell, is one of them, for example, where you can cure leukemia, certain types of leukemia that before were incurable. We have personalized medicine, um, which is not here yet, but it will be very soon in the future, where your doctor will take your specific blood samples, maybe your genetic history, maybe by then your whole genome will be sequenced and the doctor knows which mutations you have that might predispose you to certain um, conditions or disorders like diabetes, high blood pressure, um, heart problems. And then they will prescribe a plan, a health plan for you specifically. And then we have tissue engineering. Very exciting. So tissue engineering will be able to leverage synthetic biology to repair damaged tissues or completely replace damaged organs with new organs. So we will be able to grow new organs in a petri dish, such as a new heart or a new lung. Of course, we're not there yet but we will be in the future. And hopefully we'll be able to save many more lives with this technology. Okay, here we go. Now, all of this is very exciting, but keep in mind that there's biosecurity challenges, some of which I've already mentioned. Um, one of them is something called dual research of concern, dark. What that means is you can create something that can be used for good or for bad, depending on the intentions of the people or the groups that get their hands on these inventions. Then there's also the potential to misuse the synthetic biology um, for harmful purposes. You can have the accidental release of organisms or the intentional release of these engineered organisms for harm. Uh, then you are generating a lot of data, a lot of inf information, a lot of inventions. With that comes your intellectual property, whoever is funding you, uh, it might be the institution, certain governments. This is property that becomes belongs to the institution, belongs to your government, belongs to your country. Um, and there's many other countries that are interested in stealing this information from each other. So it has to be safeguarded. So, and then you may want to patent it and maybe one day form a company or something like that. And then there's the risk of bioterrorism through information theft. So here's some guidelines and um, organizations that relate to improving biosecurity and biomedicine. Um, this is a book called uh, Lab Virus Management that was um, published by one of my previous colleagues at Sandia National Labs. Then there's the um, World Health Organization Lab Biosafety Manual, uh, the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, and the Lab Biosecurity Guidelines, guidelines also from um, the WHO. And then, of course, we have the Biological Weapons Convention, EBSA, which is the European Biosafety Association and CDC and, and many others. So regulatory frameworks, I sort of put them here for your reference. Um, you probably will get the slides afterwards if you want to. 
but I won't read through all of this. But the three main ones are the Cartagena Protocol in biosafety, which regulates uh, or seeks to protect uh, biodiversity in human health from potential risks that are associated with GMOs, genetically modified organisms. Then there's the Biological and Toxic Weapons Convention and the World Health Organization Biosafety Manual. Now, what's important is these are regulatory frameworks, but they're not often laws that can be enforced. These are just sort of guidelines or good practices to follow, but organizations and individuals are not generally obligated to do so. So there's a role for, for organizations like the World Health Organization, the CDC, EPSA, and then of course, your individual institutions to make sure that you set the leadership standards, that you educate the scientists as well as the public, and that you provide training and resources for the scientists so that you know what to expect, how to um, assess the risk, of the experiments that you're going to be doing, how to mitigate the risks or decide, is this experiment worth moving forward with or not? Um, then there's institutional biosafety committees and oversight. Um, in the US it's mandatory, but in other countries, sometimes it is not. It's considered a best practice to have a committee at the institutional level that would review experiments that involve either high containment pathogens at biosafety level two or higher, or any sort of dual research of concern or potential dual, dual research of concern. And they also set best practices for the laboratories and the research at the institutional level. Then there's training for the researchers in biosecurity. I would consider today's talk part of your training and uh, collaborative efforts between all of you to increase your, your individual awareness as well as the public's awareness. This would be most important, for example, in the case where someone might propose to conduct some high-risk experiment, and then you would reach out to the local community and make sure that they have buy-in, that they've given input, and that they feel safe that you will handle the organisms safe um, in a safe manner. Then there's technological solutions. Um, for example, you know, IT security features, uh, locking your doors, things like that. There's engineer safety mechanisms, such as using your biosafety cabinets. Um, and then you wanna develop containment strategies for your research. And this should be determined not by the individual scientists, but by this group, usually the biosafety committee at your institution, um, where you have a group of scientists that are experts and they can give you advice and feedback and also oversight. And then finally, there's monitoring and surveillance uh, technologies. And this is especially important for public health. Uh, we all remember COVID, the COVID pandemic. Um, so again, monitoring things and making sure that there's no um, unusual uh, outbreaks or events happening that might go unnoticed for some time before something more serious happens. Okay, so I have created a hypothetical scenario for, for us to go through. Um, so in this hypothetical scenario, we have a synthetic Shigella bacteria that we're gonna create from nothing. We're gonna order it from the company and it's gonna come. And we are going to enhance the pathogenicity of it. And I'm being vague here on purpose. <laughs> um, so just as a background, Shigella is a gram-negative bacteria. It causes shigellosis, which is a, an infectious diarrheal disease. Um, in this hypothetical case, we're going to use synthetic biology to create a new Shigella strain 
that's more pathogenic because we want to understand the vir virulence factors. And so we can develop new therapeutics. It's a very noble thing to do. Uh, however, this experiment would fall under the category of dual research of concern. Because if you create a bacteria that's already a pathogen and you make it even more pathogenic under the hands of um, someone with bad intentions, they can use that to make lots of people sick, for example. So we're just gonna do a, a quick risk assessment. Raise your hands if anybody here has done a risk assessment before for your research. Not Felix or Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're going to work with a high risk organisms or a high risk research or synthetic biology, you should be uh, doing this as part of your regular process. It shouldn't be highly complicated. The, the more the higher the risk, the more serious the pathogen, the more involved the risk assessment should should be, but it shouldn't be something overly complicated. So in this case, Shigella is a pathogen. So we want to know who is the host. So we know the host is humans and primates. So in this case, let's say we're going to do this experiment here. Do we have any pathogen? Do we have any primates that hang around outside? No, not that I know of. Right? There's no monkeys hanging around in the trees outside. So that would put the risk a little bit lower, let's say compared to if you were in the jungle in a country in Africa, where there could be gorillas and chimps outside. Because if the Shigella were to get out, it could potentially infect those wild animal species. However, if you have higher primates at your institute, this is also a factor that you would consider because you don't want to unintentionally infect your research animals with a new pathogen. The infectious dose for Shigella is very low, 10 to 200 organisms can make you sick. So compared to other pathogens where it's 10,000 or sometimes 100,000. So this is something to keep in mind. And depending on the experiment that we're doing, this hypothetical experiment, you could make an experiment to reduce the infectious dose, and then it could be one. That would make it more pathogenic. Or you could go the other way and make it way less pathogenic. The mode of transmission for Shigella is oral fecal route. So mouth, poop. Um, not aerosol transmission. So this would help you determine the kind of PPE that you would wear and where in the lab you could work. So you don't need to wear a respirator, for example, if you were going to do this research. Um, you it's not mandatory that you must work inside the biosafety cabinet, although I would recommend it. But also this is the kind of thing that your biosafety committee would uh, analyze for you. The incubation period, if you were to get sick, is one to seven days. So this is important because if you start doing experiments in this new hypothetical organism and somebody were to become exposed and then they become sick very quickly, let's say within 12 hours, then oops, maybe what you did has decreased the incubation period for your new organism. Communicability, is, is this, that means can it be transmitted from person to person? Yes. So it can be transmitted through human feces for up to four weeks after you've cleared your infection. Zoonosis means can it be transmitted from an animal to a human or a human to an animal? Usually, no. Vectors, so if you remember from microbiology, a vector is an inanimate object, although in this case we're considering fly a vector, but it can survive on the fly um, as well. And then survivability outside of your host, which would be you. It can survive for months on dry surfaces, for days on contaminated vegetables, um, metal utensils, it can survive on feces, in water, and on flies. If you want to inactivate it, this is very important for the lab. How would you kill this organism that you're gonna create? So the 
the wild type Shigella or the the one that not the one that we're creating, but the one that we already know. One hour on the autoclave or seven seventy percent ethanol or one percent bleach. But if you were creating a new one, you would have to assess: is this new organism going to be inactivated by one hour on the autoclave? Maybe the one that you created, you can't kill it, or it will take three hours instead of one hour. Is it susceptible to drugs? Yes, you can treat Shigella with uh, antibiotics. However, there's multi-drug resistance that has been resurfacing. And lab-acquired infections for laboratorians. Actually, Shigella infection is the most common lab-acquired infection um, because it's, it has a very low infectious dose and is very virulent. So it's also important to keep in mind that Shigella bacteria can produce two toxins, Clostridia toxins, one and two. E. coli produces a similar toxin. So if you've ever had, um, in the US they call it stomach flu, where you eat some food that maybe had bacteria and then you get very sick for the next few days, it can be the toxin or it can be the bacteria that's making you sick. So for biosecurity reasons, the toxin is also important because someone with bad intentions may not be so interested in the bacteria itself, they may be interested in the toxin because the toxin can be made, it can be purified, and then it can be dispersed. So in this case, you want to say, what genetic changes are we making? Are we going to modify the binding affinity of the bacteria, of the toxin, the thermal liability, because the toxin itself has to be destroyed? Um, so the biosecurity concerns here is you're developing this new strain of an already known pathogen that may have enhanced pathogenicity. And so there's all these biosecurity concerns that you have to keep in mind. So you have to know the organism itself, the knowledge and techniques that you are developing in the process of this experiment, that in itself is a biosecurity concern that needs to be protected. You cannot disperse that. You cannot go to a conference and have a poster and have a step-by-step -step protocol of how you're gonna do this. You shouldn't be publishing this in a journal, for example. Um, so here are some things I want you to think about. It's a little pause on, on this case. So before you start a new experiment as a scientist, you may think, oh, this is so really exciting. This is cool. The science is so interesting. We usually, scientists, get carried away by the scientific question. But think about biosafety and biosecurity. Think about, is this experiment that you want to do absolutely necessary? Or can I do it a different way? Can I use a different attenuated organism? Can I use a different organism? Can I do it without using the organism at all? In vitro. Um, think about what are the possible unintended consequences of what you want to do. Unintended consequences in the lab, which means can someone in the lab get infected with this? Can they get sick? Can we get contamination with our other experiments? Can we contaminate our plants, our stocks, our animals? And think about what are the unintended consequences if this were to get out of the lab and to the outside nearby community. And then think about, let's say you've thought about all of this and said, yes, it's necessary, we're going to do it. Then the next step is, how will I secure all of these materials? They need to be locked up in a box, in a fridge, in a freezer. That room needs to be locked up. You need to have an inventory and you need to have keys and the people that have access to this material need to be vetted somehow, make sure that they are reliable and trustworthy. And, and then you have to monitor all of this. You're, you can't just have an inventory and, and look at it once a year because if somebody wants to steal your newly generated pathogen, they can just come in in between those 12 months and you are not gonna know. And then you also have to monitor who comes in and out of the room. Let's say you have that in place. Then do you have protocols 
so that if there's an emergency, you can respond. What happens if someone is working in the lab with this pathogen and all of a sudden they have a heart attack and you have to call the ambulance and, and the paramedics have to come in where they could potentially be exposed to this pathogen too, right? You have to think about this ahead of time. Think about what if you unintentionally release it. Let's say you thought one hour in the autoclave would kill it. So you put it in the autoclave, you sterilize it, and you put it in the trash, and it goes to the local waste processing plant. But then you realize that it didn't kill it. It needed two hours. Now you have released this material out into the community. Now what are you going to do? It's best to think about these things ahead of time rather than in the moment. Um, and then what if somebody intentionally steals your material? What are you going to do? How are you going to respond? Which leads to the next question to ask yourself. And this might be more at the institutional level than at your individual level as a scientist, which is have you talked to the local government and made agreements ahead of time in case something happens. So let's say, did you talk to the local waste facility that handles this waste that you autoclave? Do they know that potentially they could receive this and, and you've made an agreement that if you did, you could just go and retrieve it and bring it back? That way they won't be surprised or upset, right? Um, also, you might have to talk to the public health department, the local public health department, in case there's a release and there might be a case outside. They need to help you with the epidemiology of it, or they may take over. You might need to talk to the local hospital in case one of the researchers gets sick and they go to the hospital. Because if you're working with some foreign pathogen, for example, that it doesn't occur here, um, they might not be looking for that when they're assessing when someone is sick. For example, um, there was a case in Chicago many years ago, a fatal case. There was a famous scientist that worked with Yersinia pestis, plague, in the lab. Um, it was an attenuated strain. So they worked in BSL-2 containment and the scientist became sick with plague. He didn't know it at the time. He went to the hospital and the doctors didn't think of plague because there is no plague in Chicago. So he's, he had some respiratory issues. Um, they didn't know what to do. They, they, sent, they said he should go to the hospital. He didn't go to the hospital. He went home and subsequently a few days later he died. And then they did an autopsy and took a sample to microbiology and the microbiologist diagnosed uh, Yersinia pestis. At that point, all the hospital staff that treated him, the ambulance people, the people at the morgue, um, the, the people that did the autopsy, the clinical laboratorians had all been potentially exposed to this pathogen. Luckily, no one else got sick, but, but they could have been. So also keep in mind, if you're working with something unusual, if you get sick, monitor your own symptoms. And then if you go to the hospital, make sure you mention this to the doctor. Say, I work with this organism. Yeah. Just a, another comment when I used to do research. Each laboratory that potentially hosted or interacted with these potentially dangerous organisms, they had to have a catalog available within the lab. So for example, if there was a fire and the fire brigade had to come, yes. They had to, before entering the building, they had to know what they were going to be exposed to. Yes. Well. And where it is. Yeah. And yeah. how it was being stored in correct. Yeah. So also I want you to think about this concept that is relatively new but not so new of one health. And one health means that we are all interconnected. Let me see if I can move this up. We are all interconnected. We're in one planet. So sometimes people that work on plants, they just think of plants. And if you work with a plant pathogen, 
you think, oh, I don't have to worry about too much because it's just a plant pathogen. It's not going to make me sick. So it's no big deal. I don't have to worry about the containment. But your plant pathogen might make another plant sick, right? Or it might get out of the lab and affect the local fauna and flora. And the people that work with animals think, just think of the animals. And the people that work with humans just think of humans. And then there's people that work with the environment, you know, with air or soil or water contamination. But we are all interconnected. So whatever is happening to the humans might affect the animals. Whatever is happening to the animals might affect the environment. And on it goes. So when you're doing your risk assessments, keep, keep this in mind too. And one current example is there's been an outbreak of bird flu. It's been going on for almost two years now. It's affected millions of birds, wild birds, as well as farm animals. And it's now been jumping to some mammal species. There was, a, I believe, a mink farm in Spain. Um, but most people don't know about it because it's not being reported in the news because it's not killing humans, so we don't. But it is having devastating consequences worldwide. So also one health is, I had a mentor that used to say, animals and pathogens, they can't read. So they don't know that they're not supposed to behave a certain way. And also they, they don't care about borders. <laughs> so don't think, oh, just because it's this country, it's in this country, but it's not in my country, so I don't have to worry about it. Um, they can move back and forth. Okay, so going back to our little case, here are some measures that I would advise that should be taken in this scenario. You have to review and have oversight. So a committee should review this proposed research and then they should give feedback to the scientists. And, and the committee needs to think about the regulatory authorities and then who else needs to approve it. So for example, in the US, if you're proposing dual research of concern experiments, it has to go to the National Institutes of Health for review. And in some cases, the director of the National Institutes personally has to approve the experiment. So it's not just your PI in the lab or the director of your center. In some cases, it might go all the way up. And then the committees then have to ensure that whatever you said you were going to do is actually what you're doing, which means they have to come to your lab and inspect they have to review records. If you say you're gonna keep a log of your inventory, they will show up and say, show me your log. Let me, let's make sure that you did do this. Um, and this is how we keep these tight ethical standards. Then we need to have some sort of laboratory containment. I would put this research at a biosafety level three because it's a new pathogen that we're developing. So that would come along with high containment, negative air pressure, um, possibly a respirator, even though it's not the aerosol route, enhanced PPE. And then you have to have risk mitigation strategies that this scientists need to develop. For example, a protocol or a standard operating procedure like I mentioned before. What happens if there's an emergency? How are you going to handle it? If you have a spill, how will you clean it up? Who will clean it up? Do you know how to clean it up? Have you been trained? Did you practice? Um, sometimes you just write a little very pretty paper and you say, we're going to do it this way. And then you never did it. You didn't practice. And then when it actually comes to it, you might realize, oh, this step doesn't work. We wrote it wrong. Um, and you don't want to be surprised and do it for the first time the day that there's an emergency. You wanna practice, practice, practice. And then always you have to keep updated inventory. Then you have to limit who knows about this. So you, like I mentioned before, you can't go around in your conference and tell everybody about it. Unfortunately, you can't. You might not be able to publish it in a journal or only very few sort of secret journals. I'm not sure in the European Union if there's um, classified journals 
in the US there are where you can publish this information, but only people that have security clearances have access to these journals. Um, because we know publication is very important for your degrees and for academic risks, just in general for your academic career. Um, but this is not the information that you want to put in plus one or nature or science. Then you want to talk about international collaborations um, and make sure you work closely with other partners. Um, nowadays, research is very international. If you're conducting some research, chances are you're not doing it by yourself. You have collaborators in other parts of the world. So the same thing, if you're doing this type of research, your collaborators in their countries, in their institutions, they also have to assess. And then in general, we have to promote a culture of responsibility. So we all have to be responsible. We have to follow the guidelines. Whatever the safety committee says that you do, you do. Even though you're tired and you're doing an experiment late at night and you don't want to put those gloves or the mask on because you just want to get this done, you must. Because in those times when you're tired and it's late at night, that's usually when something happens. And then you have to be aware, ultimately, these committees, these policies, these guidelines, they're not supervising you 24 seven, and they're not the police of you. You are responsible for the safety and the security of yourself, your lab, your colleagues, and, and the research that you're doing. So in this hypothetical scenario, I wanted to highlight biosecurity concerns. So hopefully I have highlighted the need to have Robust oversight means you don't just do the experiment in your lab before telling anybody. Um, and then you have to have containment measures that are strict. You have to have risk mitigation like PPE and protocols and standard operating procedures and training. And then you need to have information that's shared responsibly. Your computers need to be locked. Uh, don't put something on a cloud, make sure that nobody that doesn't need the access to this information has access. And then make sure that you follow the guidelines and behave ethically. So this is what I'm gonna ask you to do as scientists. I want you to be proactive in biosecurity as you're conducting your research in synthetic biology, which I'm sure you're all doing a little bit of. Your research, I'm sure, will revolutionize medicine, biomedicine, biotechnology somehow. Uh, but you must include and ensure that it's safe and secure. Biosafety and biosecurity in your labs, in your research, with your data, that everything is protected. And then I want you to engage in continued dialogues and collaboration. If you're a student, as you grow up, if you're already faculty or researcher, just keep doing this. Always engage in dialogue with your colleagues. If they didn't come to this talk, now you go and tell them about it. Tell them what you learned. Talk to other stakeholders in your community. Your community could be your institute. So maybe as a student, it doesn't apply. But if you're a faculty member, maybe you need to talk to your um, department chair or your director. I don't really know how this organization is organized, but you know, you may need to go and talk to them and say, hey, it's important that you give us the budget to have a negative air pressure room in the building because of this and this and this. So that they understand why this is important and not just, oh, I have to, you're coming to ask me for money, but I don't really know why. And I don't want to give it to you, right? And also you want to talk to other stakeholders in the community might be scientists that make policy or people that work in policy that are not necessarily scientists, but they're still in the scientific community. It could be scientific writers. And of course, always the public. You want to make sure that the public is aware of what you're doing, that they're comfortable and, and that they accept it to the extent that is possible. I mean, you can't tell them everything that you're doing, but as much as you can. 
And uh, with that, I thank you and I'd be happy to take any questions. And here's my information. You feel free to reach me any way you want.